So we're in chapter 21 of Luke. If you want to turn there. And um, the, the last chapter of chapter 20, so much of it has to do with the Lord getting questioned. He's getting peppered by scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leadership in Israel. Uh, but the questions weren't sincere. The questions were trying to expose him or to trap him, to get him to be exposed as somebody who's a phony because they want to try and get rid of him. They're threatened by him. What he has done in all of this was he's answered questions uh, which can't be answered again because he is the truth. He is mercifully still dealing with people who many of them were his enemies. But his indictment of the nation, specifically of the leaders, was they lacked heart for God. There's hypocrisy. There's outward religion. There's inward hypocrisy. Uh, it was religion absent of life. They were materialistic. They were lovers of money. They loved honor among people. They loved power over the people. This is who they were. And unfortunately, much of the nation followed after them. Not all, um, but many. So here in chapter 21, there's a, there's a rest between what he's saying to the leaders as the multitudes are listening and as he gets into a lot of the teaching about the second coming, and we're going to get into that in the next couple of weeks after this little section. But here there's a rest from that recent exchange that he had with the leadership. And he just exposed their hypocrisy, and now he's going to show sincerity. You're going to see genuine religion placed against fake religion. And you have that in the next four verses here with the offering of a widow. If you read ahead, then you're going to know what I'm talking about. In chapter 21, verse 1, it says, And he looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. And that's a, that's a section in and of itself, so we're just going to look at that this morning before we get into what he says about the temple and, his, and the destruction of the temple and the second coming. Mark also gives us a record of this chapter. It says that he's sitting opposite the treasury. So if you were to look at a picture of the temple as, as we can best describe it today, you had Solomon's porch on the outside, the, the furthest point on the outside. Inside that, the court of women. Remember, they weren't allowed to pass a certain point. Inside of the court of women, which is the furthest section out among the Gentiles, excuse me, the, the, it was close to the court of the Gentiles, was the treasury. So when it says he's sitting opposite the treasury, there were 13 offering boxes called the shofarath, like the shofar, or like it looked like a, uh, a trumpet. They were, they were beaten into the shape of an instrument-like offering box. There were 13. There were seven on one side, and there were six on the other side. Some of them were labeled for the poor. Some of them were labeled for the sacrifices. So he's sitting somewhere on a bench, and he's watching. It's interesting that he's watching, Mark says, how they're giving. So he's looking at the outward show of offerings. Now, we need to remember that it was something commanded in the Old Testament. Three times a year, Deuteronomy 16 says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. That would be Jerusalem, specifically at the temple, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So you're at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which connected to the Passover. He's about to be sacrificed as the Passover. At this time, they were supposed to appear before the Lord, not empty-handed. That's what God says. So when you come, there's supposed to be an offering. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. So here they are, they're giving, and they're offering outwardly. There was an outward demonstration. Everybody could see it. Two things caught the Lord's eyes. First, 
how the rich people put their money into the treasury. Mark tells us this. He watched how they gave. The second thing that caught his eye was what a poor widow gave. And we see right here, he even makes a comment about what she gave. What did she give? We have the record, two mites. So what was a mite? Well, it was very difficult to try and calculate that to a current monetary value today, but a mite was basically one-eighth of a penny. Some commentators think one-sixteenth of a penny. It's very difficult to know. Think about what you do with a penny today. When I was a kid, that's right, I was a kid at some point. Some of you are like, you were a kid. I was, a long, long time ago. You could actually get something with a penny. They had gumball machines that took pennies. They valued pennies. Now you look at a penny, you might just kind of say, it's a penny, you know, just kind of throw it in the change tray. I don't know how I'm going to use it someday. Maybe I'll deposit it at the bank and get something from it when I get a million of them. But there still actually is value to that, just not as much. Well, the mite was a lepta, that's the word, and it had to do with like a shaving of something. So if you picture like a very thin, thin piece of metal, much like the, the, the width of a leaf is the idea. That's how weighty her offering was. She had two of them. That might have been her day's wage if she actually had a wage at all. So she came with two of those, and she had an option when she came to the offering boxes. Should I give something for the poor? Now, here's a person who was a poor widow thinking about who's she gonna, how she's going to give to the poor. Or am, I, or am I going to give this to the box that's going to go to the offerings of the Lord, the sacrifice? And so that's what he's watching, how they gave and what she gave. Now, in the way in which they gave the offer box, it, it wasn't a right or wrong thing. It was public. He doesn't denounce the fact that the, that the, the boxes were in a trumpet shape. He doesn't denounce the fact that it's in public. There's only so much privacy you can get with this because people were traveling they had to come with the offerings, the money that they had, the sacrifices that they were willing to give at the feast day, and it was public. So when God gathered them together, much like he gathers us today on Sunday mornings, he gathers us publicly. He gathered them publicly. But there's something about the way they did it that stood out to him. There seems to be a fanfare, some type of commotion an outward display that brought attention to those givers as they brought their large, lavish gifts. He doesn't go into what it was, but it was enough for him to watch how they gave. And no doubt it was impressive to some of the people who were watching. And they gave a lot. But the way they gave could have come from a heart that wanted to make an impression on people to get their praise from people. You could, you know, you, there's different ways churches receive offerings or events receive offerings that are church type of or church sponsored or parachurch ministry offerings that could actually generate a fanfare or a public commotion but lose the whole point of offering to God where it's really an offering to God. Some are very private, you know, where you could just do it online. You know, we live in an age where you could do almost everything online, right? Nothing wrong with that. You could do that online if you just click your life away. We live in a generation now where just that's all people do. I don't even know if the younger generation knows what a penny or a nickel or a quarter or a dollar bill is anymore. We are actually headed towards a cashless society at some point. It'll just make more sense. Sometimes they have lines where people actually walk towards the front, right, of the church, or you, you, you could do that. Now, what the, you could turn it into a dance-a-thon as you're doing it, where you're actually making a commotion so everybody sees that you're going towards the front and you're making your offering, or, you, or in some places, like, I'd like for somebody to stand up if they're going to give towards this cause. You stand up and you raise your hand. Well, what about the people who don't stand up or raise their hand if they're not going to give towards the cause? You've just turned it into something now that is now more public than it is real worship, or you, you, or you could tend towards that. You could turn it into that. And you can add into a pressure situation as well, 
for if I don't stand up, if I don't raise my hand to give towards this charity or to give towards this second or third or fourth or fifth offering in the church, towards whatever fund it is, I look like, and that's the problem, now I look like to who? And if I do stand up, I do raise my hand, or I write my check and let the money deacon or elder or whatever they're called in the church, the treasurer, see what I'm giving, then it's turned into something that people are watching instead of it being before God. And because of our sinful nature and our pride nature, we respond like that to please people. Or, and, and there's multiple reasons that that could be dangerous. What he says here is, is very important for us. God is watching how, not just what, how we give. Jesus is sitting there watching how they give. Again, this Mark chapter 12, verse 42. He fills that in for us. They gave, he said, out of their abundance. He knows what they're giving. He knows how much they have. She gave all of her livelihood. She gave, according to what Jesus said, more than they all. Now, according to men, they would have been like, she gave two, to us, worthless pieces of might. But he's saying something much different. They both left an impression on him, one negative, one positive. The positive impression was from the person that we would not have been positively oppressed if we watched it. The negative impression was, was from the ones he said, it was just from their abundance. It really didn't impact them at all. So in, that, in those short four verses, we see what type of giving God approves of in the middle of all this. And remember, he just came out of warning them in chapter 20. I'm just going to go back to this and read this to you, verse 46. Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. He just warned them about people who were using religion to line their own pockets and their own egos with people's praise. And then he sees a lot of people who were giving, and he's not faulting the giving, or, 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 or it's, 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 the, it's the reason behind it. It's the motive behind it. So you can come to church on a Sunday and be like, you know what, here it is. It's a giving teaching. I knew it was going to come. I've been here for two months. I haven't heard. There it is. Eventually you're going to get me. Look, we go through the scripture, and you come upon these passages, and you teach them, and you teach biblically what is the right way and what is the wrong way to do this. The right way should lead to a blessing. The wrong way should be checked and repented of or avoided, right? So that we understand what God approves of here. He's telling us what he approves of here. He's telling us what to watch out for, to be careful. He says, beware. And they're still around today. They might not have long robes. Some people might get impressed with a guy on TV with a long robe. Wow, he's got a long robe and a, and a shofar trumpet. I better give to his ministry because he's really spiritual. Or he might be attracted to the, to, to the person who's just you know, very normal looking and, and just dressed like very casual or really dressed up, but there's an impression and a pressure they could put on people to give to a ministry or to themselves, but in reality, they're just trying to devour those who are more vulnerable. I watched it years ago in my own family. My grandmother is still alive. I came home from college, and there she was, sitting in front of the TV. She was living with us at that time. And I heard somebody screaming through my parents' TV at my grandmother about giving. And I turned it off, and I just looked at her and said, Granny? I called her Granny. I said, Granny, he's crazy. <laughs> Do not give a dime to him. He just wa And here she was. She was a widow. And she would have just given to anybody because she was susceptible. 
around today as well. Peter says this, to a real pastor, shepherd the flock of God which is, is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. There are people who are in ministry. There are people who will try to get people to give because there's greed involved. He, he said in Luke chapter 16, the Pharisees were lovers of money. And when they heard Jesus teach, they derided him. Luke chapter 19, say, he said to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You just care about what you can get from people. And they're still out there today. And we need to be careful that we're not misled, that we're not feeling pressured. Oh, you need to give to this ministry. Because if you don't give this ministry, it's not going to keep going on. So you need to seed your money. And you can write your seed money to this radio station, to this TV station, or this ministry. First of all, if people have to put pressure on you to keep their ministry alive. Maybe it's not of God. God can keep his church alive. God can keep his ministry alive without putting pressure on people. You never see that in the scripture. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, he said, you know, I'll just read it to you. I didn't have this one down, the references. By the way, there's a couple things I didn't put in the references. Sorry, Nate, last minute thoughts in the morning. I came to me and I was like, you know what? I need to say this this morning. But he said, now concerning the collection of the saints for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so should you do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Paul, Paul interestingly, when he came to the church, was like, okay, guys, collection time. Oh, no, here comes Paul again. He said, I don't even want to see it. That's, but there was something that they regularly did, but there was no pressure on the church. Something that you need to be able to willingly lay aside before the Lord yourself, before God. Race Demon told the story of, of, a, of a, uh, a guy who responded to, it was a radio program, and they were saying, look, we do need your support. And we, we're telling you by the Lord that if you send a check of $76 to our station, that's seed money, that God will triple that and give that back to you. And that'll keep our program alive. So one guy said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to let you send me a check for $76. And then God will send you the money. Right? So if you're telling me that, why don't you do that? And if you do that to everybody, you'll never have a problem. You'll just keep getting that tripled over and over and over again. So let me show, see you do that first. And there, there is, we have to be careful as the reason why. Sometimes when you hear those, the pressure, they, they, a lot of times they're saying it based on a person's desire to get more. There are people who give, hoping, hopefully you're going to get more from God. If you give this much, God's going to give that back to you. We'll look at a couple passages about sowing and reaping in a minute, but there's no guarantee that if you give, that God's going to make you rich and keep tripling and quadrupling your money. That can't be the motive as to why we do that. Somebody said this, if you give because it pays, it won't pay. That's not why we should be giving to God, because then that could be based and there's a desire to receive back something monetarily from him. The truth is that there are those in this world that God does say who are well off. He says in 1 Timothy 16, not to be haughty, to trust in, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us all richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may hold on to eternal life. So there is a challenge and I would say as Americans, the majority of us who have more than most of the world, to not be haughty, not to trust in it, but to be able to distribute, be rich in good works, not just in rich in good offerings, rich in good works, then ready to give, willing to share. That eternity is put before us. And, and we are to be reminded that life itself is not based in what we have or what we have not. Jesus said that. It doesn't consist in the things that you think. Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. We make a living by what we get. There's things that we need, but we make a life by what we give. 
So we need to be careful of the, of the teachers who put pressure to line their own pockets, and that was what was happening here. Jesus warned them about those who would try to devour people's homes. Still around today. If he gave the warning then, it's for today as well. But then there's a foundation of worship and offering that we need to remember as well. All throughout the Old Testament, saints offered to God in the form of a sacrifice. Abel brought a sacrifice to God. Abram brought sacrifices to God. David brought sacrifices to God. But it begins with the reality that before what we have materially to give to him, he wants something much deeper. We have to remember that. He wants something that's, this, that's the foundation of our salvation. To be understood before we begin to serve him with our, whatever, our finances or our works. Without which, it doesn't count. So David in Psalm 51 said this, You don't desire a sacrifice, or I would give it. You don't delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Now, he wrote that after his massive failure with Bathsheba. So in other words, he's saying, you don't desire me like, to pay you off. I can't go to the temple and just sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. That's not going to cover my sin. What he desires is a genuine, humble, broken heart and spirit. That a man or a woman, when they come before God, they understand their place before God. I am broken over my failure. I'm broken over my sinfulness. I'm humbled. I know who I am. I know who you are. All the sacrifices in the world won't cover my sins. All the sacrifices and giving in the world won't make me right with God. David knew that. He was a very rich man. But it took that failure to get to the point of that brokenness where he understood the thing that's acceptable to God for me to bring is brokenness in my heart, genuine. And that's why we have that penned by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 40 says this, Sacrificing offering, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Hebrews goes on and says, he's talking about a body you prepare for me. That's Christ. In other words, Jesus is saying, those, all those sacrifices, all those offerings, was not ultimately what God desired. It's me, Jesus, coming into the world in the body God gave to me to be the sacrifice for sins. That's where it all starts. All of it. We need to remember to, the basic foundation of our acceptance with God, our relationship with God, is based on Jesus coming into the world, giving himself to the Father for us in our place on the cross, and for us to be in the place of brokenness, knowing our place before him. God looks and he desires for humility, broken spirit, contrite heart. He looks at the Son of God who gave himself on that cross for us. That's where it all has to begin. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and these are passages that have to do with the reason why we give. Go back to what he was saying about the widow as opposed to those who are making a fanfare of their offering. This all connects by why we do what we do, who we are before God. It's all because of Christ, all because of what he did. Paul said this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. For if there is first a willing mind, now here comes the offering, it's accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Okay, so first, the grace of Christ, he gave up all of his wealth, all the riches of heaven, becomes a man. When he became human, he became poor. Remember, even when he said, show me a denarius, he didn't pull one out of his own pocket. He borrowed something from them for an example. As far as we know, he didn't even take it. 
so that we could be rich. What type of rich is he talking about? Not American gospel rich. That's what that's about. Rich in Christ. Heirs of God. Eternally saved. And when this world is over, all the things that we have or have not will not matter anymore. That's what's going to matter. The, the, the riches that we have ahead in heaven. He gave all that up so that we can have all that he has in heaven, heirs of the kingdom of God. Then he says, now, <clears throat> there has to be a willing mind to give. Willing, not forced, willing. And whatever you want to give, it's only, it's only accepted if you have it. Find that interesting? Not if you don't have it. I'd love to give $1,000, but I only got five. God's like, well, they don't offer me $1,000. Very simple math. No matter what type of pressure you might feel from somebody else to compare or somebody's putting a guilt trip on you, it can't be that. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, he says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand. This is an offering from the church for other churches who had need that Paul was going to take with him which you previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. You hear that? Here's Paul saying, it's got to come from a willing mind. It has to be based on knowing the grace of God in your own life. It has to be based on what you have, not what you have not. And it can't be out of grudging obligation. i got to give this ministry again because they're making me raise my hand in public. And they're coming around to receive my offering. That's not what they did. It has to be from generosity, willingness, not obligation. And then he does say, look, this, I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In other words, there is a sowing and reaping in our lives, right? This is where some prosperity preachers go off. Oh, I see that. You better sow the seed now, brother, or you're not going to be loaded. And that's not what he's saying either. Paul sowed abundantly. He had nothing. He ended up in prison. This is reaping. God's like, yes, you are reaping some serious rewards, Paul. Okay, <laughs> you had to learn what that means, too. And you learn it by looking at the lives of the people who taught it. So important to understand the context here and what that means. So let each one give as he purposes where? In his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful. So in other words, you can give out a grudging obligation over and above, but God's like, but I love a cheerful giver. It has to be something that you purpose in your heart based on your relationship with God for what he's already done for you, the foundation of salvation given to you based on what he's done in your love for him. I like what Tozer said. I like a lot of what he says, but he said in, in, in relation to giving, he said, in God's sight, my giving is measured not by how much I give, but how much I have left after my gift. Not by its size is my gift judged, but how much of me there's in it. No one has given anything acceptable to God until he's first given himself in love and sacrifice. That's what God's looking for. And I think that's right on. Now, God understood the reasons why this woman only had two mites. If other people looked at her, and I doubt they were really looking at her like, they were looking at the people who were bringing in their carts of cash and whatever else, and they were being impressed by it. So she, I think she just kind of snuck in there and dink, dink, and, and left, as I think most people would do. If that's what they had to give. But you could have judged her only two. Mice, two thin pieces of copper left over. But what matters most is what God knows. He understands every reason why we do what we do or don't do, what we have, what we don't have. Our circumstances are all known to him, and that's what we need to be concerned about, right? God cares mostly about our motive, more than the amount every time. That's the heart of it. The amount, though, can reveal the motive as well. 
So that's why David said this. And this is this is this is just something that's very practical. David said this when he was going to build an altar on the threshing floor of Aronai. Some of you guys know the story. There's an angel standing over that place. It's on Mount Moriah. It's where the temple eventually would be built. There's a plague sent by God over the people of Israel. David knew that God wanted an altar built there. And when he went to that place, Arna said, I will give it to you. David said, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. It wouldn't be an offering to him if you give that to me. If I'm going to offer this to God, then it's going to cost me something. Something. Right? And again, but not out of, David didn't do that grudgingly or like, oh gosh, I got to give this because this is what God wants. I want to do this. We can give without love, but we can't love without giving. So God cares about the motive. God understands the reasons of everything that's going on in our lives. We need to be just concerned about him. But at the same time, it will cost us something. And in God's economy, which is the economy of heaven, she gave more. She gave more. He said it. She gave more. So even if people question, yeah, but when we do the counting here, it doesn't seem like she gave more. He says, no, she put in more than they all. And the reason is because they gave out of their abundance. She gave more because she had nothing left over. George Mueller said, God judges what we give by what we keep. She kept nothing back. Wearsby said, men see what we give, God sees what's left. And that's why it was worth more to God, because it cost her more. And she did that out of love's sake, as an example for us. And he had complete count of all things that was given that day. Men keep count of things, but he has complete accounting of everything Morgan says he held in his hands the balances of eternity and the rich in one hand and the widow in the other and hers was greater. Men wouldn't have said that, but God says that and that's what counts. And he doubled what she gave and redoubled it over and over again for us today to learn a lesson from her. She would have never thought this thing. You know what? Thousands of years ago, they're going to be learning about me because I've got these two little mites I'm, I'm dropping in the box. The other guys might have been like, this will be a lesson for the ages. But in reality, Jesus says, that's a lesson for the ages. Like Mary's ointment. Why this waste? That was, by by the way, a very expensive offering Mary poured on Christ. It, It was worth about a year's wages. Judas, why this waste? Jesus says, leave her alone going to be written as a memorial for what she's done to me about her. And here we are today. We still remember Mary. We don't have to worry about the amount to make an impact when we put it in God's hands. We just have to give what we have with a willing heart. Thousands of people before him, hungry. Where are we going to get bread? Where are we going to get food to feed these people? Well, there's a kid over here with five loaves and two delicious fishes, but what is that among so many people? Bring it to me. That was enough. She had no idea that we'd be learning of her and the eternal rewards that were had for her. Last thing is an example for us to remember. She gave all. The word there for life is bios. She gave all of herself. Before she gave the two mites, she gave all of herself, like Jesus. He gave all of himself. That's why this is an example for us. It was like the way he gave. He gave all of himself. She gave out of her poverty. He became poor and gave out of his poverty. What did he actually have physically? As far as we know, clothes on his back, some sandals that were left at the foot of his cross when he died. That's what he had. And when he came into the world, he had nothing. When he came out of this world, he had nothing. But through that weakness, through that poverty, through the emptying of himself, he wrought for us salvation. And he's still looking 
or hearts that are loyal to him. He was looking. He was watching. And I believe, in a way, humanly speaking, refreshed. Look at that. She gave all. Ah, they're not looking at it much, but I see it. And it'll be written of for an example for thousands of years. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. He's still looking today. And it's all small to him. It's all weak to him. Whether you have $2 million or two pennies, $5 billion or $5, to God, it's all small to him. He doesn't need it. He's not up in heaven saying, Michael, how are the heavenly treasures going? They're real Lord low. low. Let's get the thermometer out in some of the churches. Today. God's not like that to, to get an offering. He's like, I don't need it. What he wants is us to give ourselves to him in love. It's the most important thing to him. He wants us. It's Father's Day. When your kids are little, you want a nap. I heard that, Brent. And I agree. Leave me alone. When you're a little bit older, you don't take naps. Naps take you. You ever notice that? Dad's asleep over there again. He just kind of got seized by a nap. So it's a little bit different. And when your kids are a little bit older, they say things like, what do you want for Father's Day? And I tell you something, I'm like, serve me. Serve me. <laughs> Give me something. You got money. You got work. Go get me something. It's a joke. In reality, I'll say, I don't really want anything. You know what I actually want? Fellowship. Amen. That's the most important thing that the Father really wants is your love for each other. You love me, love your mom, love each other, love God. That's the heart of a father. And, and what you do with yourself, whatever that is, give your bios, your life, your whole life, your physical life, your spiritual life to God. I can trust that God will lead every one of us in how to sacrifice and how to give to him if he has our hearts. That's the most important thing to God because he'll tell you. There's no pressure. It needs to be from love for him, looking at him, what he did for us. I don't hold anything back from him. It's all his. That's the example we have this morning. We're going to get into some teaching on the second coming. The next couple of weeks, I encourage you to read ahead. Let's stand, close with a word of prayer.